Good morning. Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though, not a Montague. What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Now I've no doubt that all our fifth form will recognise this quote well. It comes from Act 2, Scene 2 of Romeo and Juliet. Juliet is speaking and the message of her speech is that Romeo's name means nothing and that the fact that they come from two warring families, two households both alike in dignity as Shakespeare puts it, should not stop these star-crossed lovers from being together. Today, I want to talk about names and how we use them. As so often with me, I'd like to start with ancient Rome. Now, many Roman men had three names, their primal men, their first name, so Marcus, Gaius, and so on. Their nomen, which is the name of their gens, so everyone who was descended from the same ancestor. So the Julii were the family of Julius Caesar. Some Romans, though, were given a cognomen, a third name that was associated often with a peculiar physical feature. The cognomen of Marcus Tullius Cicero, the famous Roman politician and orator, meant chickpea, possibly because of a cleft on the nose of one of his ancestors that looked like a chickpea, or possibly because his family sold chickpeas. Publius Ovidius, the famous Latin poet Ovid, had the cognomen Nasso, or Big Nose. Pretty brutal stuff. He appropriated that name, though, and refers to himself in his poems as Nasso, as Big Nose, because Ovidius doesn't scan into the elegiac meter. There was a whole family with the cognomen Scaevola, which means lefty or left-handed. There are loads of these sorts of names. Some are more famous than others. Scaurus meant swollen ankles, Pulcher meant beautiful, and Ahenobarbus meant red-bearded. The name by which we know the third Roman emperor, Caligula, is a sort of cognomen. The name of this really monstrous creature means little boot, all because he had a tiny soldier's uniform made for him when he was a child following his dad around the army camp in which they lived. It's worth noting as well that Roman women, mostly, just took the name of their father. So Julius Caesar's daughter was Julia. Julius Caesar's sister was also Julia. And his aunt, you've guessed it, Julia. Sometimes if there were two sisters, they might take the name Julia Major and Julia Minor, Big Julia and Little Julia. Ancient Rome was quite clearly a patriarchal society, one in which the role of women was subservient to that of men, and so they didn't merit their own distinct name. They were the daughter of their father, and that was it. What I like about Latin cognomen is that they are essentially nicknames. I love a good nickname. They can be so unbelievably funny. Sport is a famed breeding ground for nicknames. I've played in teams where no one is referred to by their given name, but instead they are given a nickname. There's often a biting wit at play when dealing with sporting nicknames. The former Australian Rugby Union captain, John Eales, was an incredibly good player. The first man to win the World Cup twice. His nickname was Nobody, because nobody's perfect. Cricket has some cracking nicknames, Paul Remains, the former Gloucestershire batsman, was nicknamed Human, as in Human Remains. Rather more scatological, former England player Vic Marks was known as Skid. I'll leave you to work out why. Some names are witty and some are cruel, and some are both. I know a club cricketer known as Gloria because they look a little bit like the hippo in the film Madagascar. My sons play a fair bit of cricket and have some pretty good nicknames. My 15-year-old is known as Alice at our cricket club as his hair is too long 
and he wears an Alice band when bowling, hence Alice. My 16-year-old was known as Surrey because he used to play cricket for Surrey and once, foolishly, wore a Surrey cap to training. That name was used even more regularly when he was dropped from the Surrey squad. Cruel? A little. Funny? Certainly. Sometimes, though, cricket and sport get it horribly wrong when there's no attempt at humour and when there is instead just abuse. The Yorkshire cricketer Azim Rafiq has been in the news of late talking about his experience of racist abuse in his time at the club. He spoke to a group of members of parliament about how he was treated. There were abusive terms used, racist terms that I certainly shan't repeat here. Cricket commentators who had worked at Yorkshire have been suspended from their roles. And cricket has been doing a lot of soul searching and the leaders of the game, notably Joe Root, the England captain, have spoken an awful lot about increasing diversity in the sport and making sure that cricket is equal. Names have been a big part of what Yorkshire has allowed to get wrong. One of their former players, apparently, called any player who wasn't white Kevin, rather than bother to pronounce their name properly. Yorkshire Cricket Club has gotten a lot of things wrong, and 16 members of staff, so far, have been moved on from their jobs. Part of the problem was that the institution of Yorkshire County Cricket Club was unwilling to either acknowledge the problem or, when they finally did acknowledge it, they attempted to brush it under the carpet and to minimise it. Now this is really easy for institutions to do and when they do, people feel isolated, alone and like their voice doesn't matter. I have a fairly straightforward first name, Benjamin. I've hardly ever had that mispronounced, though I have had people in Israel pronounce it Benjamin. My surname, Horan, is a slightly different matter, but only slightly. Is it Horan? Is it Horan? Is it Horan? It isn't quite as straightforward as my first name. I've had people mispronounce it, but it isn't like they can really get it that wrong, and I'm relaxed about it, mostly because I'm not really too sure how it should be pronounced myself. I have taught students though with names that are very difficult to pronounce. My favourite example of this was a boy of Sri Lankan heritage whose surname was Wickramarache Apahamalage. Now that's a surname that is 11 syllables long. I was absolutely determined to get it right though. And so I asked Sean, which was his first name, to stop me every time he saw me around school to make sure that I could pronounce his name properly and he wasn't allowed to let me go until I got it right. He was happy to oblige and took great pleasure in making sure that I pronounced his name correctly. It meant that our relationship as teacher and pupil was, I like to think, pretty strong. I took the time to learn his name and, I hope, I treated him with respect. Unlike those Yorkshire cricketers who called anyone whose name that they couldn't be bothered to learn how to pronounce, Kevin. What got me thinking about names wasn't Yorkshire cricket though. It was our school, Prior Park. I heard that one of our lower five students, Gigi, was upset and I spoke to her to find out some more detail. It emerged that Gigi, who is black, was fairly regularly being mistaken for other black female students in our school by members of staff. One of the students she was mistaken for was a girl in the year above, Tyler. Now Tyler is mixed race and significantly shorter than Gigi. I spoke to Tyler as well and she confirmed that she's been mistaken for Gigi and for other black female students. Both Gigi and Tyler are pretty sporty but they do look very different. And I'm a little confused as to how some teachers have mistaken one pupil for another. Is it an example of unconscious bias? If it is, then we need to be aware of it and call out examples of it when we see it. It is important to do this with some sensitivity though. Most people would be mortified and quite rightly if they realised that they were doing it. They don't necessarily do it on purpose. There are scientific reasons for getting people's names mixed up when they are of a different race to you. 
Research shows that people can identify faces from their own race better. It is called the cross-race effect. The high-level visual cortex part of the brain, which is the part used to process faces, is, it seems, pretty hopeless at responding to faces of people of a different race to you. Brent Hughes, a psychology professor at the University of California, has said in the white people he tested, this area of the brain that's supposedly specialised for faces is really responding way, way more to white faces and treating black faces as almost like they're not faces. He goes on to say that when you see someone as part of another group and you process them, you identify their racial group membership and then you sort of cut processing off at that level. There have been some high profile cases where this has happened. A former government minister, government minister the education secretary, Gavin Williamson, confused the footballer, Marcus Rashford, with the rugby player, Maro Itoje. And the only things they've got in common is their skin color and that they're high profile athletes. Itoje went on to Twitter to say, due to recent speculation, I thought it was necessary to confirm that I am not Marcus Rashford. And he pretty much won the internet on that day. So there may be some scientific reasons why these sorts of mistakes might happen. And there is a large difference between racist Yorkshire cricketers calling people Kevin and a teacher accidentally mistaking one black student for another black student. However, I want you all to imagine how it must feel to be that student. Your name is a crucial part of your identity. If you lose it, then you lose a bit of yourself. Susan Fisk, a psychology professor at Princeton, says that if people consciously try, then they can bypass the way that the brain might normally respond to a face from a different race. If you do try and respond to someone as an individual, then you are less likely to mix them up with other people in the future. Now, I think that we are working hard as a school to become more inclusive, to embrace the diversity of our community as much as we possibly can. Thinking on Yorkshire County Cricket Club's failure to put their hands up when they got things wrong though, I want Pryor to be better than that. I want to acknowledge it when we, as an institution, get things wrong or could do better. I don't want to do this to make those who've made mistakes feel bad. However, I do want us all including teachers, to try a little harder and to work at responding to everyone in our community as individuals. After all, one of Pryor's slogans is room to be me, not room to be mistaken for someone who might kind of look a little bit like me. We'll finish with a prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Hopefully, we can see that the names we use and the effort that we all put into getting to know someone properly is something that we can and should change. When the time comes, I hope that you all have a fabulous Christmas break.